Hi, everybody. I know it's running off the edge. I apologize. Um, but I think it'll be fine. Thank you for coming to Death of Anonymous Travel. Can everybody hear me okay? Uh-oh. A um, couple announcements before we, we start. This presentation is not on the conference CD. If you want a copy of it, we have separate CDs. They're available in the back, and I have a few up front here which you can grab afterwards. So today we're going to talk about how uh, the systems we use for communication and for payment have changed dramatically in the past 10 or 20 years, so that we've reached the point where they're um, constantly generating geolocation information that's very individualized. And third parties are able to collect this information and analyze it, not just to figure out what your history was, what your behaviors have been in the past, but also to predict what your behaviors might be in the future. Who am I? My name is Sherry Davidoff. I'm, along with Jonathan Hamm, the co-author of SANS's Network Forensics class, which is running this fall in San Diego. I'm also the author of philosecurity.org, an online blog. I've been a security professional for about 10 years now. I started off on MIT's network security team, and now I'm an independent consultant. I've done work for the healthcare industry, for law enforcement, for uh, financial industries, manufacturing. I've been around a while. So as we run through this, um, some questions to keep in your mind. Who knows that you're here? Who knows you're in Las Vegas? Who knows that you're at this hotel at the Riviera? Who knows that you're attending the DEF CON conference? And who knows that you're in this room watching this presentation right now? The answers to these questions will depend on the methods that you've chosen to use for travel, the methods that you use for payment and for communication. Did you fly here? Did you rent a car? If you rented a car, where did you buy gas? It, how did you check into your hotel room? Did you use a credit card? How are you going to pay for it? What have you bought in this hotel? Did you buy a latte? Did you buy a drink at the bar? Have you used an ATM? Have you gambled with your debit card? Perhaps most importantly, are you carrying a cell phone? Those wonderful mobile tracking devices. Do you have a credit card that has an RFID chip embedded in it? Do you have an RFID passport? All of these questions impact who knows you're here and what kind of geolocation information has been generated about you personally. Knowledge is power. The systems that we're going to talk about today include cell phones, credit cards, license plate tracking, RFID tracking, electronic fare systems that can track commuters when you go to work every day, traveler registration databases, um, things like the no-fly list, and surveillance camera networks which are going up in cities all around the world. As we discuss these systems, try to think like a programmer. Think about the error conditions that could happen, how we can detect them, and how we can handle them. Please turn off your cell phones. They're watching you. This was an article on the front page of the Wall Street Journal about a month ago, and it really caught my attention for a few different reasons. Obviously, there's the very graphic image of a poor Iranian woman who was killed during a protest. The headline under the picture reads, Iran's web spying aided by Western technology. Um, Iran has a central telecommunications choke point within their country, which they use to monitor all communications that happen. And the article says that they're doing deep packet inspection, so they're monitoring the contents of emails, of IMs, and they're also using this to block certain websites. Iran, by the way, now has more journalists in prison than China. The second disturbing thing about this article is that it says European gear used in vast effort to monitor communications. So European con countries have been facilitating um, the repression of free speech and the monitoring of people within Iran. Specifically, the article talks about Nokia Siemens, a European uh, joint venture, and Nokia Siemens has sold Iran a monitoring center. Nokia Siemens um, put out a press release that says that their so the uh, equipment that they sold Iran is not capable of deep packet inspection, and um, it's primarily used for the purposes of lawful intercept of phone voice communications. If you look at the marketing material, you see that it is marketed primarily for those purposes. Um, the yellow box, it can be used in fixed networks, mobile networks. It can also intercept communications on IP networks. Um, I know it's a little bit cut off, but one of the selling points is nationwide monitoring. Monitoring possible. I'd be interested in that. 
An interesting add-on to the monitoring center. It's a mobile location tracking component, which says it's an ideal solution to track, record, extrapolate, and anticipate the movements of mobile devices. As we're going to talk about in a little more in depth in a bit, um, your cell phone constantly generates geolocation information about where you are. And that information can be collected in mass. And there are a number of private companies offering software now that can analyze that information. The third disturbing thing about this article is something that was never said at all. It implies that the countries in which this software is being created are also using it to monitor their citizens' communications. Nokia Siemens has a product called the Intelligence Platform, and the Monitoring Center is only one component of the Intelligence Platform. A couple years ago, a, a sales presentation from Siemens was leaked onto the internet. This is a screenshot of their intelligence desk, which is now just one component of the larger intelligence platform. You can see that geographical view is one component, and it can uh, take a variety of sources of information, including vehicle tracking using toll road systems, so things like Easy Pass, other electronic fare systems, location information of ATM machines, so when you use an ATM, there's geolocation information about that available, and mobile phone tracking. And all of that data can be overlaid on top of each other and correlated to create a pretty detailed picture of your activities. Um, an important thing to recognize about this software and software like it is that it's not really being marketed to analyze one person's data, but to analyze many millions of people's information and pick needles out of haystacks. Another selling point uh, from the brochure of the intelligence platform, processing of mass data to enable comprehensive investigations. Here are examples of data sources that government, law enforcement, intelligence agencies can use to get your geolocation information. The first one is the Siemens Monitoring Center, and as we talked about, that takes in telecommunications information. Traffic control points, so hidden traffic cameras which are going up all over the world. Uh, credit card transactions, very important, bank account transactions, car rental databases, and car rental companies have started GPS tracking all of their, all of their cars as they drive around, um, which I think we'll talk about later as well. So the first primary technology which influences um, the detail in which we're tracked is cell phones. If you wanted to track a population of people, the first thing you would probably want to do is to try to get them to voluntarily car carry around some tracking device at all, the, all the time. And uh, that has happened. Your cell phone is fundamentally functioning as a tracking device right now. Cell phones have been able to provide general location information since they were created. So you could always find out, based on what sour, cell towers a uh, cell phone was communicating with, approximately where it was. The granularity of information available from cell phones increased dramatically um, because of FCC regulations in the United States, which required, starting in 2005, that carriers be able to trace calls to within 50 to 100 meters. So the initial um, impetus of this was because when you use your landline in the, in the United States to call emergency responders, they'll get your address and emergency responders will be dispatched to the scene. Obviously, if you're using a cell phone, this is a problem. They might not know exactly where you're located. So the FCC wanted to make it so that emergency responders could find you if you called 911 in the event of an emergency. So now telecommunications companies, upon request, have to provide latitude and longitude to emergency responders and law enforcement in the event of an emergency. They had their choice of methods that they were going to use to implement this. Some of them chose to upgrade their networks and to add more receivers so that um, they could better triangulate their signal, your signal or figure out, based on the time difference of arrival, when your signal got to particular cell towers, actually very, um, very closely to where you were located. Some of them also chose to use GPS in handsets. Um, I was looking for a cell phone in 2005 or 2006 in the, in the United States, and I was unable to find one that didn't have GPS in it. Uh, interestingly, Egypt um, has banned the sale of iPhones that have GPS capabilities in them for national security reasons. So if you want to buy an iPhone in Egypt, it has to have GPS disabled. 
the telecommunications companies are trying to recoup their investments in um, these location-based enhancements by offering location-based services. So Verizon has a service called Chaperone. Um, you can see in the screenshot here, parents can use that to track their kids wherever they go, and if their kids go outside particular zones, it'll alert them. They also have a service called VZ Navigator, which lets you get directions, figure out where you are if you're lost. Um, telecommunications companies are pretty straightforward about the fact that your wireless device can determine its and your physical geographical location. And they also say that software applications, including those by third parties, can get your geolocation information and send it back to the application provider or to other people. Google is one such um, third party. They have software called Latitude, which enables you to automatically share your location from a phone, and uh, they'll put that up on Google Maps so all of your friends can find you wherever you are. Um, when you sign up for these location-based services, you have to really read the fine print because in a lot of cases, you're signing over your rights to privacy with respect to your location. Employers and schools are getting in on the action. Um, in New Jersey, Montclair State University required mandatory cell phones with GPS software for all students. The vendor that they're using is named Rave Guardian, and um, the campus police have access to your GPS information so that in the event of an emergency, they can find out where you are. It's, uh, it's kind of a pity that this graphic is cut off, but it's from their marketing material, and it's a picture of a little student stick figure that says, watch over me. Um, that's, that's, of course, what college students want. In New York, uh, a carpenter who worked for the public school system named John Halpin was fired because his employer figured out that he was skipping out on work early. The way his employer figured this out is that um, they had given him a cell phone that had GPS software installed on it so they could track him wherever he went. Um, and he protested, saying that he had never been informed that the cell phone had that capabilities, um, but unfortunately he's still lost in court. There are a number of third-party spyware applications also that people can install on your phone, either legally or illegally. Mobile Spy is one of these pieces of software. It's marketed as being for the Apple iPhone, although it can work on other smartphones. And this is a screenshot of their GPS location capabilities. If a, anyone who installs this software on your phone can use a web browser and go to their um, central website and find out the time, the latitude and longitude of the place you were at at that time, and then um, they can pull up a map that has your location so that they can track you. The iPhone, as a side note, also uses a third method in order to figure out where you are. Um, there's a system called Skyhook, which, uh, can, which figures out what wireless access points you're near and what cell towers you're near, you're near and figures out your location based on that. Um, I think when they originally started the program, they had taxi drivers driving around in order to collect the information and generate a central database. Now they actually have a team of 500 people driving around cities uh, to create that central map. The founders of the company say that it's self-healing, so if your iPhone finds an access point that wasn't there before, it will automatically update the database, and that's one of the reasons why the system works so well. AOL also uses it so that buddies can find out where they are, where your buddy is. And I find memory cards in your digital camera. You may not realize this, but sometimes memory cards and digital cameras figure out what location you're at and will stamp your pictures accordingly. Um, there was a case a few years ago in 2006 where the FBI was monitoring an organized crime family, the Genovese family. And rather than installing a separate audio bug um, in order to listen in, on, listen in on their conversations, they simply installed spyware on their Nextel cell phones. So um, the most interesting about this case to me was that the spyware functioned regardless of whether the cell phone was turned on or off. And the same thing can be done uh, with respect to GPS tracking. Someone can install spyware on your phone, and that can send your, your location back to a third party, regardless of whether your cell phone is turned on or off. So we're generating an enormous amount of geolocation all the time as we're walking around with our cell phones. Every time you make a phone call, of, for, of course, that reveals your location information. But also as you walk around, your cell phone will periodically communicate with cell towers in order to properly route your calls in the future. So um, how can this information by, be leveraged by intelligence agencies, by government, or by law enforcement? This is a screenshot from a demonstration that was done by Thorpe Glenn in 2008. And Thorpe Glenn is a 
British telecommunications spin-off. Um, they, they make software, they created software, I think this was actually created while they were still part of British telecommunications, to track people's locations and also do social profiling. In this demonstration, they took um, cell records from 50 million Indonesian users and they crunched that data in order to identify small groups of people who were only calling each other. So they found out that 48 million of these real cell phone users were part of one large call group and then 2 million of them were actually part of much smaller isolated cells that only called each other. In this part of the demonstration, you can see that they take data from uh, multiple cell phones, from uh, your laptop, from your landline, and they can use that to track your location. They also explicitly point out that they can detect that profile again even if the phone and SIM card are changed. So even if you throw away your cell phone and you get a completely new cell phone, they still know that it's you and they can automatically track you because they're basing this not just on you know, serial numbers of your phone, but also where you're going. You're still going the same places, you're still calling the same people, they still know that it's you. This is a screenshot from their geographic profiling example in the demonstration. You can see in the yellow, that's historical information about where this person has gone. And then in the red, you can see forced mobile location updates. So they can take information that they're getting in real time and overlay it on top of the historical records. And this is a screenshot from their social profiling page. Um, they can figure out who you have relationships with, what social groups you're part of. For this pr presentation, um, that's not what's most interesting to me. What was most interesting was the title bar. You can see here that there's an IP address, 81.143.55.50. That's a British telecommunications IP address, and that makes sense because Thorpe Glen is located in the UK in a tech park that's served by British telecommunications. However, in the title bar, we see something else. Telstra Big Pond. Telstra Big Pond is an Australian ISP, the largest Australian ISP. Why are they in the title bar of a, of a Thorpe Glen presentation? It's possible that this could explain where the 50 million Indonesian users' call records came from because um, Telstra Big Pond has partners located in Indonesia. In any case, for those of you who are Australian citizens, I would be really interested to know what kind of relationship Telstra Big Pond has with Thorpe Land and what kind of products they're using um, to analyze your cell information. Could this happen in the United States? Um, what kind of software uh, are our intelligence agencies and law enforcement agencies using to analyze call information? Is it possible that they're analyzing this information in mass and not just one person's information? Um, the first question is whether or not they have access to a large number of people's telecommunications information. And I'm not going to touch on the topic of legality here. I know the EFF has some cases about this and the question's up in the air. But um, there is evidence that, at least technically, they could have access to mass domestic call information. Um, last year, in February of 2008, a Verizon consultant, Mr. Babak Pazdar, said that he was hired by Verizon in order to upgrade their firewall configuration. And while he was on site, he was repeatedly told that there was one line, a 45 megabit per second DS3 digital line into Verizon, which was not supposed to have any access restrictions or any logging whatsoever. He says that the users of this line could have unfettered access to voice, data, and even physical location information of people using the Verizon network. Um, this was later reported in Wired Magazine as being part of the FBI's network. This is a map, also from Wired Magazine, I think it was created by the ACLU, of DCSNet, the system that the FBI uses to conduct instant wiretaps. The FBI has their own separate network which taps into the domestic telecommunications system around the country. It is um, maintained by Sprint. and. Um, the software that they used for the instant wiretaps is maintained by Booz Allen. A couple of the systems that we know about include Red Hook, the DCS 3000 system, which is used for pen trap and trace, and Digital Storm, the DCS 6000 system, which is used to conduct full wiretaps. These systems can also instantly determine the location of anyone making the call. 
The ACLU documents also reveal that in 2003 there was an audit of these systems which did not go well. It revealed a number of security management vulnerabilities, including the fact that these Windows systems um, that DCSNet runs on do not have antivirus software. They have shared accounts, so access to these systems cannot be traced back to one user. They have inappropriate logging, inappropriate password management, and um, there's no limit on the number of times that a user can attempt to log in, so it's possible that someone could be trying to brute force these accounts. So we have some concerns about the security of these systems. Um, if you're interested, by the way, in security and lawful intercept systems, you might want to, want to look into the 2004 Greek Olympics case, where the Greek lawful intercept systems were compromised by hackers and used to tap people's phone calls within Greece. The NSA. Um, the NS there is substantial evidence that the NSA has access tens of millions of domestic American uh, cell records, phone call records. This is a map also by the ACLU of the, the places we suspect within the United States that they're tapping into systems. A former AT&T telecommunications employee, Mark Klein, reported that there's a secret room in San Francisco at the Folsom Street quarters where the NSA is sniffing traffic off of AT&T's network. And they're not just sniffing internal traffic. They're also sniffing call information that goes across peering points, so uh, data that's being shared with that's going across other providers' networks as well. So to sort of recap what we know about mobile phone location data, it was initially spurred by emergency regulations, and intelligence agencies have started using this to conduct mass analysis around the world. Governments have been using this to analyze communications, location information around the world. The telecommunications companies profit off of this. Um, for example, Quest uh, has testified that the NSA offered them substantial compensation for access to their telecommunications data. Law enforcement conducts wiretaps, um, and telecommunications companies also profit off of that. Um, the telecommunications companies are offering location-based services, and they also make money not just from selling these services directly, but from offering various types of access to advertisers. And people who write or use spyware, either legally or illegally, also benefit from this. People tracking has been um, spurred, I think, by two primary technologies. One is the advent of more geolocation information coming from cell phones, and the other are the changes that have happened in payment systems. So once upon a time, people used these uh, funny, shiny metal things in order to pay for stuff. We call these coins. On the bottom here, you can see some of the earliest coins ever created by humanity in the 6th century BC. These are from Lydia. On the left, um, this is one of the earliest public, transporta public transportation tokens used in the United States. You can see one of these at the fair collection table after this talk. It's an 1871 horse cart token from Oakland. And here on the right, you see a Fujio cent. This is the first coin ever minted by the United States Continental Congress. It was designed by Benjamin Franklin, and appropriately, the motto on it was, mind your business. Very different from the payment systems we have today. Um, now we have t credit and debit cards. One of the differences between cash and credit and debit cards is that when you pay for something in cash, there is no need for someone to know your, your, your name, who you are. The object itself is not in any way linked to you. When you walk into Best Buy and you buy something with your credit card, your name is encoded on the magnetic stripe of your card. So even if you don't tell them who you are, they swipe that card into their system, and your name, along with what you purchased, when you purchased it, automatically goes into their computer data. Database. So it's linked to identification that can be tracked by third parties, such as your credit card company or your bank, and it can be controlled by third parties. I don't know if you guys travel very much. I travel a lot, and it's very annoying because once in a while I'll try to use my credit card and it'll stop, and I'll get a phone call from American Express saying, are you in Wichita? And I'll say, yes, I'm in Wichita. And they'll say, well, you have to let us know before you travel. Um, it's kind of ridiculous. I feel like they're my nanny. Uh, they can also share that information with law enforcement. So let's review who knows when you buy something. This is a screenshot of, uh, of a statement from a credit card company. And you can see that when you purchase something, when you stay at a hotel on the top or when you go to a restaurant, they know not just how much you purchased, what the restaurant was, where it was, what the restaurant's phone number was, how much you tipped. So if you go to the pharmacy and you buy headache medicine, 
You know about that. I'm okay with that. The store clerk knows about that. If you use your credit card to pay with it, then you're recorded in the store's systems, potentially, as having purchased that headache medicine. If you're part of their frequent shopper list, then they can sell that list to advertisers, and you could start receiving magazines offering ways to reduce migraines or things like that. Banks, credit card companies also know what you purchased, when you purchased it, and so do intelligence agencies. I'm going to show you a little video here um, from Russell Tice. This is from CounterPoint. Now a very public whistleblower. Thank you again for your time tonight, sir. Good evening. Thank you. Thanks La to you. Last night we discussed collection of phone and email data, envelope info, like the length of the call, but also the content. But the information they collected on, on journalists and other people, this was more than just phone and email info? Well, as far as the information, the wiretap information that, that made it to NSA, um, th there was also data mining that was involved. And at, at some point, um, information from credit card records and financial uh, transactions was married in with that information. So uh, of the lucky um, U.S. citizens, that uh, tens of thousands of whom, that are now on uh, digital databases at NSA who have no idea of this, also have that sort of information included on those digi digital uh, files that, that, that have been warehoused. Does the, uh, throwing that kind of information in there too, uh, your credit card records, where you have spent your money, it, it, does that make it clear to you who used this information or why it was used or what the goal was of gaining it? Do you have any better idea of what all this stuff was used for? Well, um, the obvious um, explanation would be that, you know, if, if you did have a potential terrorist, you'd want to know where they're spending money mm -hmm. and, and, you know, whether they purchased an airline ticket or something like that and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but once again, we're talking about tens of thousands of innocent U.S. citizens that have been caught up in this, in this trap that they, they have no clue, you know, for... This thing could sit there for 10 years and, you know, and then potentially it marries up with something else and 10 years from now they get uh, put on a no-fly list and they, won't, well, of course, won't have a clue why. So this information is being used. Um, there we go. <laughs> I'm glad he mentioned the no-fly list um, because it's important to realize that monitoring of geolocation information is just one step from restricting where you're traveling. And we can see, um, we'll talk a little bit about TSA later and the management of the no-fly list, but credit reports and credit card transactions have been used as um, at least partially the basis for putting people on the no-fly list. So those of us who care about our privacy, of course, can just use those shiny round metal things and those paper things we call cash, right? Unfortunately, not so much. Um, when I flew to DEF CON last year, I flew without a wallet. And after some excitement, I actually managed to make it onto the plane. And the stewardess came by and said, headphones, headphones, would you like to buy a headset? It's only a dollar. And I said, yeah, here's a dollar. And she said, oh, we don't take cash. We only take credit card. A lot of places have started only accepting credit cards, including JetBlue, United, and American Flights. Um, there are a bunch of toll roads in the United States that have stopped accepting cash. Is this legal? I'm not a lawyer, um, but what I gather from reading is that the Coinage Act of 1965 requires creditors to accept United States cash um, as legal tender for debts. However, if you're not servicing a debt, if you're just walking into Best Buy and buying a hard drive or something like that, they are perfectly within their rights to say, sorry, we only accept credit card. Um, Payment processing companies, credit card companies, have gotten very good at analyzing what you purchase, when you purchase it, for a variety of reasons, um, including uh, advertising or figuring out what kind of risk you are, and they want more information. American Express filed a patent in 2007 called Method and System for Facilitating a Shopping Experience. What this means in English is that they're going to put up, or they would like to put up RFID readers throughout stores, inside of stores, and make it so that somehow consumers are carrying an RFID device on their person. So that when the consumer walks around the store, they can track what aisles the consumer is walking through, what products they're looking at, at how that impacts what the consumer is buying. And of course, that's of interest to the store, that's of interest to people who are marketing their products, and that's of interest to Amex. How on earth could we get people to carry around an RFID card with them wherever they go? 
Amex came out with um, the Amex Blue Card, which has an RFID chip embedded with it in it a few years ago. How many people have this card? I had one of the, yeah, a bunch of people have this card. Oh, the scariest thing about this is that it was being marketed not just for use in shopping centers, but also schools, bus stations, or other places of public accommodation. This sort of thing is already happening in the UK. In the UK, there's a company called Path Intelligence that markets a system called Footpath. Footpath um, picks up on cell phone signals as you walk around a shopping mall, and they use that to figure out where shoppers are going. They provide that information to the mall so that the mall knows where people are congregating. They know how much to charge in rent for different stores, what locations are more popular than others. Um, obviously, there are some privacy concerns in this. They can tell uh, your location not just when you make a call, but also when your cell phone uh, has periodic communications with the cell towers. Um, however, they say that there are no privacy concerns whatsoever because these are not linked to shoppers' names. Of course, someone who independently um, knows some information about your cell phone or even um, stores in the mall that can uh, correlate that information with purchases uh, using, for example, your name on your credit card could potentially figure out who's who. So why is this happening? Why are we seeing tracking coming out of uh, purchasing? It seems like this is sort of a self-perpetuating system. Um, where you shop, what you buy, where you walk around in a store is valuable information, and the companies that collect that information can sell it to other people. It can be used for advertising. It can be used for making credit decisions about you. It can also be used by law enforcement, not just to figure out where you've been, but also as part of predictive policing strategies. And intelligence agencies can use this for mass analysis. And I want to speculate here, I don't know for sure, um, but I would be willing to bet, based on what's happening with the telecommunications industry, that when intelligence agencies get this information from credit card companies, the credit card companies are probably profiting off of it. The basis for this project actually started in 2006. I was living in Boston at the time. Boston has America's oldest subway system, and I was commuting using the subway a lot. In 2006, Boston went from the old token system to an entirely electronic fare system. So they have two different ways you can pay for your fare. There's the Charlie card, which is a thick plastic RFID card, which you've probably heard about if you were at DEF CON last year. And there's um, the Charlie ticket. The Charlie ticket has a mag stripe on it, and it's meant to be more or less disposable. You can refill it, but it's not meant to last five or ten years like the Charlie card. Both of these have a unique serial number. So as a traveler, I was concerned that every time I went through a turnstile, it would record um, my location, the date and time of travel, and that that could be stored in a central database um, where anyone could potentially access it years down the road and track me where I had been. So in order to figure out whether this was happening, I called up the MBTA and I said, what happens with the information from each of these cards when it's swiped? And the first people I spoke with at the call center said, oh, we don't keep track of that information. Don't worry about it. No privacy issues whatsoever. So I didn't believe that. So <laughs> I kept calling. And after about two weeks, I finally reached the guy that maintains the database where all of your location, date, and time information is stored. So they are keeping track of that information. They are keeping track of the rider histories as they relate to serial numbers. And they have a separate database, um, the financial database, so that every time you fill one of these cards, your name and the serial number of the card are also tracked in that. So if you have a, a Charlie card, it's possible to obtain a Charlie card um, without giving them your name. But if even one time you use a credit or debit card in that, your name can be linked in their systems to that serial number and your entire travel history can be obtained. As you can see, they're not exactly encouraging the use of cash. So how does the MBTA treat that information? Um, I want to go into this in a little bit of depth because uh, there aren't a whole lot of laws that protect your privacy when it comes to commuting. And my hope is that over the next few years, we'll start to have better privacy protections. The MBTA says that they have two types of data. They have personally identifiable information, which includes your name, your address, your financial information, your photograph. And they have aggregate information, which includes the travel patterns of your customers. They do not consider the serial number of the card to be personally identifiable information. Um, that's in direct conflict to what Massachusetts law says. Massachusetts law says that any identifying number is PII. How does this um, 
How does this relate to what happens with your information? Well, first of all, you cannot get access to your aggregate rider information. If you have a Charlie card with a serial number on it that you've been carrying around for five years, you can't find out what kind of information they have about your card. They actually say they will not respond to requests for aggregate information. You can, under Massachusetts law, get copies of records relating to your name or other personally identifiable information. So um, there's nothing to worry about, though. The MBTA does share that aggregate information with third parties. So it's possible for them to sell those databases of writer histories linked to, linked to serial numbers. It's possible for, it to get, for them to give it to law enforcement, to the Department of Homeland Security for data mining. However, they say, rest assured, that aggregate information will not allow anyone to identify you or determine anything personal, except Persons may be able to combine that information with other information they independently possess concerning you. So if someone has seen your Charlie card and has seen the serial number on it, or has seen a receipt that has the serial number on it, or just happens to have the list of aggregate information and knows your behaviors and can identify you in that list, then they could also identify which serial number goes with you and track you. The MBTA says they are not responsible for proper recipients' later use of this information. Who else might know the serial number of your card? Well, employers all over Boston, um, as part of a corporate pass program, are the ones responsible for assigning serial numbers to end users. So if they had copies of the aggregate information, then they could look up what times you were going to work, what times you were leaving for work. Um, the MBTA makes a big song and dance about the fact that PII, the financial transactions database, your name, stuff like that, are stored in a separate database from the rider histories, and so that should all make us sleep better at night. However, uh, if you know anything about programming or databases, you know that it's really not hard to link information from one database to another. And in fact, the MBTA says they do it all the time as part of, com as part of combating fraud. Aggregate data, your writer, your writer histories, are stored indefinitely. So 20 years down the line, someone could get the past 20 years of your commuting history and analyze that. PII, they say, is only stored for 14 months. But in the fine print, it says it's only stored for 14 months in active systems. That information is actually archived for the retention period required by applicable public records laws of the Commonwealth. When I spoke with them on the phone, they were a little wishy-washy, and they didn't give me an exact amount of time that that was archived for. My guess is that it's probably indefinitely. So even many years later, your travel histories can be mined. If you're old or if you're disabled, you do not have the right to privacy apparently. You have to not only give them your PII to obtain benefits, um, they will also take digital photographs of you and store those, and store those electronically forever in order to, for you to receive your benefits. So why does this matter? Um, well, first of all, as we talked about, there's very little legal protection. People have very little control over what happens to our commuting records. And um, not only do we have very little control, there's nothing that requires that we be notified if someone accesses them or if that data is shared. Intelligence agencies can grab that information to do data mining. Employers could track their employees. Subway officials could track you wherever, wherever you go and anyone that they potentially give access to. How well are these systems secured, and how do we know how well their systems are secured? Um, there have been a number of court cases involving uh, data subpoenaed from, um, from commuter records, primarily EasyPass, which we'll get to later. Amtrak. In November of last year, I grew up in New Jersey, and so I used to take Amtrak a lot from Boston to New York or from Boston to New Jersey, and I was really surprised to visit New York City last year and find these signs, um, which have a scary-looking guy who seems to be carrying a weapon and a dog. It says um, that they have employed uniformed police officers, okay, mobile security teams, that sounds kind of scary, K-9 units, and they will conduct random passenger and carry on baggage screening so they could force you to open your bag and rifle through it. They'll do identification checks. If you try to travel on Amtrak without an ID, um, then there's a reasonable chance that they'll ask for your ID and if you don't show it, you could be denied access to the trains, so thrown off the trains. Um, Amtrak and TSA, I, I thought they were, I kind of didn't take that seriously. I thought they were probably kidding. They wouldn't do that sort of thing until I saw this picture. 
On September 23rd of 2008, Amtrak and TSA conducted the largest joint simultaneous Northeast rail security operation. So they had law enforcement officers from over 100 departments deployed to 150 rail stations during rush hour, and they required commuters to show their identification to submit to baggage screening, so commuters were forced to open their bags, and uh, the TSA or Amtrak or police officials would rifle through those bags. Um, TSA, by the way, is responsible not just for airline security, but security in all modes of transportation. So the security procedures you see at the airport now, they could decide tomorrow to deploy at rail stations, bus stations, highways, even bicycles. They're, they have that uh, capability. After I arrived at Penn Station, um, I had a couple hours to kill. I was in New York City in order to go to the MTA Museum, um, the Transportation Museum, which is really interesting. I definitely recommend it for anyone interested in fare collection. Uh, I came out onto the street and I saw these cameras, or I saw these signs which said, NYPD security camera in, air in area. I walked around and I saw that there were two or three of these on every block. So I started looking around for the cameras. I saw big cameras, I saw little cameras, I saw private cameras, I saw license plate readers. And finally I saw this. It was a big camera emblazoned um, with the NYPD logo keeping tabs on a suspicious pretzel vendor <laughs> who was obviously selling suspicious pretzels. So. Again, I had a little time to kill. So I started um, looking at these cameras a little more closely. And then I went online later, and I started doing some more research to figure out what they were. It turns out that these cameras are manufactured by a company called Total Recall. Total Recall? <laughs> yeah. Total Recall did, security for the, did surveillance for the Republican National Convention, um, and these, are, these appear to be examples of the Crime Eye 505 cameras. They have digital video recorders inside. They work well during the day or at night. They're all networked, and they can all be accessed from one central location. The marketing material says um, that, that they also each function as a wireless hotspot, and um, Authorized personnel can walk up to the street near them and use a web browser in order to access the video surveillance data stored on them. So um, as a privacy geek, I really wanted to know how well these systems were secured, um, how well the web servers running on them were secured, uh, and there didn't seem to be any public information whatsoever regarding the audits that they obviously must have undergone, um, how long data was stored, how access was controlled. So to understand a little bit better about why these cameras are here, um, we have to review three different programs which have been advertised by the city of New York. The first is securing the city's program, a federal program. The second is the Lower Manhattan Security Initiative. And the third is Operation Sentinel. So the Securing the Cities program is something that was funded by the DHS under President Bush. The goal is to detect nuclear devices before they reach their targets. So $29 million out of $90 million went to the New York City area for this program. And as part of the implementation, the New York City police form partnerships with law enforcement within a 50-mile radius. They do routine vehicle scanning and vehicle tracking. They can track license plates from helicopters 2,000 feet up. And they have routine checkpoints and roadblocks on bridges, tunnels, waterways, and boats going into and out of the city. The Lower Manhattan Security Initiative is a little bit different. It's a public-private partnership, and it's modeled after London's Ring of Steel. The goal is to have 3,000 cameras deployed all over um, the Lower Manhattan area. 2,000 of these cameras are privately owned. Um, there are also 100 license plate readers, not just stationary readers, but also roving scanners. Anytime a license plate is scanned by these readers, it's automatically checked against government watch lists. And um, that information is sent back to central facilities where it's stored for five years. Out of the $100 million approximately that went to this program, $10 million from the Department of Home was from the, the Department of Homeland Security, $15 million was from the City of New York, and the rest of it was from private companies and organizations uh, that are concerned about the Lower Manhattan area. The picture you see here is 55 Broadway on the 28th floor. This is the Lower Manhattan Security Initiative Coordination Center. Um, all the license plate information and video surveillance information generated from this network of surveillance cameras and network of license plate readers goes here. And they also say that they have a secret backup location. I'm guessing it's underground. 
Um, the, uh, one of the assistant police chiefs of New York City says that the goal of the program is to require, first of all, that new skyscrapers submit blueprints uh, before they're built for review, and that security is designed into new buildings in the lower Manhattan area. They would like to make it so that the lights, the air conditioning, the internal surveillance cameras inside office buildings and the access control systems are all controlled centrally from the Lower Manhattan Coordination Center. So what's happening with this information? Um, if you commute into New York, if you drive around Lower Manhattan, if you're one of the people, as I was, that worked in Lower Manhattan, you probably want to know what's, what's uh, happening to your data, how long it's being stored, and who's accessing it. Well, first of all, um, who has access to this information? The New York City police, uh, probably federal agents who have also helped in funding and setting up this program. And stakeholders. Um, every private company who's involved in setting this up has a stakeholder representative that has access to the Lower Manhattan Security Initiative Coordination Center. All of your license plate record data of any car driving around the area is stored for five years. All of the video is stored for 30 days, unless there's some reason for it to be stored for longer. Um, and most importantly, if someone wants to use all this data that's being collected, if someone wants access to the video surveillance data and they want to use it for some other purpose, if they'd like to use the license plate records that are being collected over five years for some other purpose, they can do that. All it requires is approval from one or two people. It does not require that that be publicly announced. It does not require any sort of documentation. And there doesn't seem to be any requirement for auditing of what happens to that data later on. The information collected on you can also be shared with third parties. Again, it requires approval, but not documentation, not publication. There doesn't seem to be any reason why anyone would even find out that that information was being used by third parties. That brings us to Operation Sentinel. According to Mayor Bloomberg, Operation Sentinel is a combination of the strategies from securing the cities and the Lower Manhattan Security Initiative. The goal is to create a, a surveillance network like London's Ring of Steel pertaining to the entire city, not just Lower Manhattan. So every vehicle going in and out of the city would be photographed, and that includes the driver, along with the timestamp. Your license plate information would be recorded, a radiological signature would be taken, and that would all be sent to the Lower Manhattan Coordination Center. Um, license plate reading, there are fixed, 80 fixed license plate readers and 36 roving readers that drive around the city capturing license plate information. Right now that's being deployed at seven vehicle crossings, including the Holland and Lincoln Tunnels, um, the George Washington Bridge, and the goal is to eventually send that to all vehicle crossings. So every vehicle going in and out of Manhattan, you would be photographed, you would have your license plate captured and stored, and the radiological signature stored and that information could be shared with third parties um, with only approval. It could be used for secondary purposes and you would never know. Bus surveillance. New York City also has bus surveillance, um, but the leader in this initiative, at least as far as I can tell, is Chicago. Chicago has a partnership with IBM. The goal is to put cameras on 2,100 buses. There are seven video surveillance cameras on each bus and a digital video recorder on board. Each bus acts as a wireless hotspot, so any supervisory vehicle driving within a three to four block radius of the bus can access the video surveillance information. Again, questions of how well are they securing this, how often is it audited, um, how do you know who's been accessing this information? Chicago and IBM has, have also partnered on a project project called Operation Virtual Shield. This is a project where thousands of video surveillance access points are being deployed around Chicago. Um, I say access points because they're not just video cameras. They're connected in a wireless mesh network, and according to the marketing materials, they have analytic software on them so that they can respond to incidents. So if they hear a yell or if there's a sound of a gunshot or something like that, the cameras can react and zoom in on a particular area and capture more information coming from that source. They also have license plate readers, um, which are similarly networked. It's worth pointing out that uh, this isn't IBM's first rodeo. They worked with China to deploy over 200,000 surveillance cameras in Shenzhen a few years ago. These surveillance cameras were disguised as lampposts, and the goal in China is to have 2 million cameras all connected to one central network. Um, 
it's probably safe to say that any contractor, such as IBM, that's um, working on projects like this, citywide surveillance projects, is probably taking the, the information they learned by setting this up in one country and using it for other countries. So um, the same types of programs that IBM is deploying in China, they're also deploying here in the United States. Moving on to cars. This is a screenshot from the Siemens intelligence desk that we discussed earlier. And the very first thing that they pointed out was that they could capture information that comes from toll road systems. So once upon a time, uh, this is what toll booths looked like. You would drive up, and there would be a basket. And you'd take this round, shiny metal thing, and you would throw it into the basket. And hopefully, a little bar would go up, and you would be able to drive through. It was also beautifully simple. Nowadays, um, all over the United States, actually all over the world, we have cashless toll systems, systems like Fastlane or EasyPass, which are connected to the registered vehicle owner's identification. Every time you drive through one of these toll booths, it will record um, not just who you are, but how fast you're going, what time you went there. All this information has been used in hundreds of court cases. Um, and there's also differential pricing, so people have a real financial incentive to move to these systems. Unfortunately, we're paying for that in our privacy. If you care about your privacy, you could still pay in cash, right? Unfortunately, um, not. In some places, such as the Bush Turnpike, uh, at the beginning of July, stopped accepting cash entirely. If you're driving along on the highway and you come to a toll booth on, or not a toll booth, a toll area on the Bush Turnpike, you have two options. First, you can pay with your Texas toll tag. Um, you can browse the fare collection table afterwards. I have a Texas toll tag if you want to look at it. Or you can pay in zip cash. Zip cash, unlike what its name implies, is not cash. What it means is that they do optical character recognition of the car's license plate, and they will then mail a bill to the registered owner. So if you're a driver and you would like to pay for tolls without the registered vehicle owner having to deal with it, you don't have that option. And unfortunately, I think that probably also discourages ride sharing. Um, and as an environmentalist, uh, I would really like to encourage people to share cars and not discourage them. That brings us to an important question. Um, when it comes to either violations or tolls, who's liable? Is the driver liable? Is it all right to say that the owner is liable for tolls when it was actually the driver that incurred them? It really depends on what state you're in. Um, in states like Georgia, Delaware, Washington, D.C., New York, North Carolina, the owner is explicitly liable by law for violations. In other states, the driver, um, in states like California, Colorado, and Virginia, the driver is explicitly liable for violations. So that sort of sets um, some precedent for whether or not the owner or the driver could be liable for tolls. There was an interesting case involving the Minnesota Supreme Court. Minneapolis um, started installing hidden traffic cameras, uh, and the Minnesota Supreme Court struck that down because of a statewide uniformity principle, which says that both drivers and owners um, should be able to expect the same type of treatment regardless where in the state they're driving. So it's not okay for them to drive through one city and suddenly have a totally different liability than in other cities. So they struck down the hidden traffic camera program uh, because of uniformity and also for a few other reasons. If you're a privacy geek, um, you probably saw this coming. In April of 2009, New York City deployed easy, easy pass transponders on the Brooklyn Bridge and in Lower Manhattan, not for the purposes of tolling, but for monitoring traffic. And as part of this, it calculates the routes that cars are taking and also their travel times, and it stores that in a central database and then analyze that, uh, analyzes that, presumably for the purposes of controlling traffic flow. Some people are understandably concerned about privacy, and the powers that be have waved those concerns away, saying that, well, these systems can't read license plates, so don't worry about it. Of course, easy pass identifiers can also be linked to an individual. In the UK, um, they're one step ahead of us in the United States. The UK has a system called Automatic Number Plate Recognition. They have over 2,000 cameras deployed already. And the system can read um, up to 50 million plates a day. All of that data is stored for five years at the National ANPR Data Center. It includes the location that you were driving, the date, and the time. And it's clear from some of the events that have occurred that they're mining this information. Um, there was a couple, a father and daughter couple, 
who was pulled over not too long ago and arrested because um, data from the system had captured their license plate driving near a demonstration. So as a result, they were pulled over and brought into custody. The UK has also deployed RFID license plates um, implemented by a company called ePlate. The RFID plates broadcast information for up to 300 feet, and they've had this system since 2005. I'm sorry, I don't know if we've run out of CDs in the back. Uh, there are a few up here, and the presentation will also be available on the web afterwards. Um, they've deployed active RFID systems. There's only 15 of them, so they're probably already gone. Don't bother getting up. Vultures. So the benefit of um, RFID systems for tracking license plates is that they can be hidden easier than optical character recognition, sim op optical character recognition systems. They don't have to be visible. In Brazil, they've employed um, government-mandated GPS tracking devices on every car. I, I don't fault them for this. Um, they have a real problem with vehicle theft in Brazil, uh, so that's why they've employed these GPS tracking devices on all cars. One of the most interesting things about these tracking devices is that they do more than tracking. The police can actually shut the vehicle down remotely. So you could be driving along in your car, let's say it's a stolen car you're driving along in, and the police could figure out where you are and shut it down. The same thing uh, is available in the United States. OnStar um, was installed in GM cars, and it tracks not just your GPS location and your speed. The idea behind OnStar, one of the selling points, is that in the event of an emergency or if you're lost, you can press a button on your car and communicate with um, people at their central location who can help you figure out where you are or dispatch people if you need some assistance. Um, in order to do this, they track a lot of information about your car, including where you are, how fast you're going, sometimes even things like the fuel intake, uh, the fuel level of your car, when you brake, stuff like that. Um, all this information is stored on their central systems. How well do they control it? There are some privacy exceptions that they're very explicit about. They say that they can disclose your information to protect their rights or property or the safety of you or others or to troubleshoot, um, presumably really if they feel like it. All the information from OnStar goes across Verizon's network, so the FBI already has access to it. And there's also um, something called stolen vehicle slowdown. If OnStar or if law enforcement want to stop your car remotely, they can do that just by sending a signal, and that will stop the fuel intake, and your car will stop wherever it is. What could go wrong with this system? Um, somebody could shut down your car against your will remotely. Uh, I don't know how vulnerable it is to hackers. Um, I don't know what kind of security it has. That information isn't really public. But accidents could be caused remotely. And also, anyone with access to OnStar's system or the Verizon network could potentially track you wherever you go. Moving on to uh, traffic enforcement systems. Red light cameras have exploded in popularity all around the world. This is a map from a site called photoenforce.com of all the red light cameras that are just in the New York area. They have been described by journalists as cash machines for the local government. Their safety is questionable. Um, there are indications that they do reduce the number of people that run red lights. There are also indications that they increase the number of people who slam on the brakes and then get smacked by the car behind them. A Canadian journalist pointed this out um, and was subsequently stalked by the Canadian police. Red light cameras can also be used for national surveillance. Um, the way most of these systems work is that they deploy multiple cameras at any particular intersection. So they get multiple shots of the cars. They can see not just your license plate, not just a, a picture of your car, but also images of the driver. They can have um, not just digital still photographs, but also video surveillance of the car. Redflex and American Traffic Solutions have been actively shopping their systems around as national surveillance networks to local and federal law enforcement. They also have license plate tracking capabilities. One of the reasons why these systems would be useful for um, national surveillance capabilities is because they bypass all of the GPS tracking restrictions um, that have been so legally questionable these days. Um, we've seen a number of cases in the past few years where law enforcement tries to install a GPS tracking device in or on a car 
And in some cases, the judge rules that's okay. In some cases, it's not okay. Whether or not they need a warrant is in question. If you have um, a dense network of cameras that can read license plate, plates and put that all in a central database all throughout the country, you don't need to use GPS to track a vehicle. You can get that information from the network itself. I'm proud to say, as a Montanan, that Montana outlawed hidden traffic cameras in May. Um, my representative, Bill Nooney, was the one sponsoring the bill, and uh, our governor signed it into law in May. Um, Jonathan Hamm and I had the opportunity to go to uh, to go to the Montana State House in Helena in February, where we expressed our support for this bill. This is a picture of our representative reading my note of support. So if you care about these issues, um, please do contact your representatives and encourage them to pass laws that properly manage uh, your information, because we can make a difference on these topics. Some concerns about the ways um, information is being handled. Redflex is going to be. Um, we're going to go into a little detail about a company called Redflex. Redflex, according to them, are the largest manufacturer of hidden traffic cameras in the United States. And they do more than just install and manage the equipment used for enforcement. They also capture, um, they also do citation processing. So they have things like your name, your address, your height, your weight, your gender, your driver's license number, which in some cases is still your social security number. And they correlate all that to driver videos and images. Most of the um, companies that we're talking about, we don't have the ability to actually access their systems and evaluate whether or not they're secure. In Redflex, in Redflex's case, when I was doing the research for this presentation, I came across a publicly available site which is used by law enforcement all over the country um, to approve or reject violations. And you could see just by looking at the source code of the publicly facing page that it has some serious security problems. The information contained in it, your motor vehicle information, could potentially be mined by anyone. And there is no accountability or public oversight. So um, we're about to go into detail on these vulnerabilities. The reason I'm disclosing them is because it's important for uh, average citizens to know about this so that we can understand how our data is being managed. And it's important for law enforcement to know about this so that they understand that the systems they're using um, may not be as reliable as they would like. When I notified the vendor about these vulnerabilities, they responded very promptly and they removed publicly accessible links uh, right away. So Red Flex traffic systems, they're deployed in over 240 cities in the United States. They are the largest red light and speed enforcement provider in North America, according to their marketing materials. They have cameras, multiple cameras installed at any intersection that they're monitoring, so they can get digital stills or full video of passing motorists. They have a system on the back end called Smart Ops. They use this to process the citations. And we can get a little bit more information by looking at the contracts that local governments have put online, which, describes, which describe how the systems are used. Here you can see this is from the city of Daly City in California. And it says, Redflex will place an electronic file containing printed, original, and nominated citation information on the Redflex FTP site each day for court retrieval. So if you're a security geek, you probably did a little, what? Um, <laughs> when you realize that this information was potentially being transmitted unencrypted over the internet. Hopefully, they didn't really mean that. It also says uh, in 31 and 32, Redflex shall place offenses in the police authorization queue within six days of the violation. So as soon as um, a red light or hidden traffic camera sends up an alert, that goes to their smart ops processing system. They create um, citations, and then they, they uh, allow police to access those citations. The local police will review that and will determine whether to approve or reject each of the citations. If they approve it, then Redflex mails out the citation to individuals, and they have access to your name and address and other driver information, so they can mail those citations out. Some of the information that they have, we've already run through this a little bit, first name, middle name, last name, birth date, height, weight, hair color, eye color, gender, address, your license plate number, in some cases that is still people's social security numbers, driver's license state, a description of where you were, the location, what your offense description was, um, your license plate, and all that is correlated with driver images and video. 
When I ran this presentation by Jennifer Granick of the EFF, she asked a great question right away, which is, where are they getting this information? <clears throat> I had kind of assumed that they were probably getting it from the towns, but I did a little bit of research, and I found that that wasn't the case. Um, companies like Redflex and OnStar and other companies are partners in the International Justice and Public Safety Information Sharing Network. I'm sorry? Oh, no, I'm good. Um, they're partners in the International Justice and Public Safety Information Sharing Network. So all these companies have, um, what you can see on the website is, securely limited access to motor vehicle registration information necessary for the enforcement of traffic-related violations. Well, how well are they securing this information? Presumably, they get periodically audited to make sure that they're keeping all of this private and that it's all, all their systems are up to date, right? Okay, well, if you Google for RedFlex and Smart Ops, their back-end processing system, the first site comes up is the RedFlex Traffic S Systems Web Ops site. This is a screenshot of it. You can see um, there are two links, violation authorization. Presumably, that's where police officers will go on and view a list of incidents and figure out which ones they want to approve and which ones they want to reject. The second one is online reports. At the bottom, it says, if the flash buttons and logo do not show up above, you may use these links to get to the capital S secure sites. And uh, then there's a link to violation authorization, online reports, and then you can see there's a cute little VeriSign secure logo, which makes me feel much more confident. <laughs> of course, if you actually view the source of that page or click on the links, you'll see that um, this login page doesn't actually use SSL. It, yeah. <laughs> It just sends a username and password unencrypted across the internet. The other page, Violation Authorization, does use SSL. If you right-click and view the source of the page, there is an enormous amount of information in there. Um, let's go through some of it. Here we see, uh, just by the variable names, um, you can see that they're processing some very sensitive information. And public, uh, the public link to this page is no longer available. Um, each incident, for each incident, uh, the variables include birth date, hair, eyes, weight, gender, height, driver's license number, in some cases still a social security number, driver's license state, license plate number, jurisdiction, and in the code they also have uh, things like image pass, so they're correlating this information with images of the car and driver, and presumably in some cases also video depending on what the camera is capable of. If you go down a little bit further, you'll see some SQL statements, um, which give information about their database. So uh, here the comment is, get contracts that this user has permission for. They create um, what's going to become a URL, and in that URL is a select statement, a SQL select statement, and then they do an asynchronous request, they get a list of contracts back and a list of variables back, and they store that on the client side, and they use this XML object, these XML objects as uh, client side permissions. So as a private citizen, I'm getting a little bit worried because if all of this data is stored on the client side, then the end user could potentially modify them and bypass any access restrictions. Here we see they're doing client-side authorization. This comment is, if the record can be authorized and the user is allowed to, then show the accept, reject stuff. So if the variable police user, for example, is yes, and that's taken from the client side, then you would show the accept, reject buttons. Um, yeah. Not that you need the accept reject buttons because you can just create the correct URL and uh, make a request that way. Uh, um, you can also see here there are media redacted users. Don't display the active reports links for the media redacted user. That depends on the attribute police user being equal to D. Um, at the bottom we see S URL equals and then uh, they get an incident list. So that's how they get the list of incidents. They make another asynchronous request. They also do client-side filtering. Um, as security geeks know, uh, filtering is one of, uh, lack of appropriate filtering is one of the reasons why SQL injection attacks work. So here you can see they're removing invalid characters from the license plate. They're doing this in the client-side code. So anyone with access to Paros proxy or probably who just creates the correct U URL could bypass this filtering and uh, request, make requests which include other characters. 
there are also indications of who their clients are and what, their, what the processes um, are that law enforcement use with respect to license um, violations. Here it says, for the city of Chicago, apparently one of their clients, display only license state so that the pre-approving officer and supervisor can enter a license plate in jurisdiction, blah, blah, blah. Um, but again, if an end user wanted to, they could bypass this restriction. And it also appears that this code... Um, depends on sending a variable called schema name to Chicago, in this case, CHI. What would happen if you set that to Albany or New York or Atlanta or something else? Could you view lists of incidents from other sites? Um, all the information uh, that I gathered was simply based on observation. This has not been tested out, uh, but the vendor has been notified of this, and hopefully they will correct the internal problems as quickly as possible. The reason um, that I wanted to cover this in this presentation is because Redflex is not alone. Redflex is one of many, many government contractors that stores sensitive personal information. Every company that was on that list of partners that we displayed a little while ago has access to the same types of information. These companies are not subject to routine audits. If you look at the contracts that are out there, you can see that their books can be regularly audited, but it says nothing about their IT systems. It says nothing about how well their systems have to be secured, who they can share their information with. Um, a lot of this is because people in local government who are signing these contracts don't know a whole lot about IT security, and they're not employing IT professionals to look at these systems before they hire the companies. There's a lack of accountability, and we really need to do a better job all over the country in protecting citizens' private data. Thanks. Moving on to airlines. Um, I don't know if you guys remember back in 2002 or 2003, JetBlue was publicly flogged for giving five million passenger records to a government contractor by the name of Torch. What happened was uh, Torch was doing an airline passenger risk assessment. They were working with TSA, and they approached um, companies. They approached companies like American Airlines and Delta to get lists of passenger records. American and Delta rejected them, and then TSA wrote a letter on their behalf to JetBlue, and JetBlue provided their government contractor, Axiom, with um, five million passenger records, including not only itineraries, but your name, your address, your contact information. Uh, Torch then purchased um, a supplemental Axiom database, which included social security numbers, all the different places you've lived, address histories, how far you live from airports, things like that. And they used that um, to demonstrate that airline passenger and, rep and reservation data can be clustered. So you can take information from credit reports, from address histories, and look at passenger itineraries, passenger names, and use that to identify groups of passengers who are part of the mainstream, and then groups of passengers who are different. Um, this is uh, similar but not directly related to the CAPS-2 system, which used credit reports in order to determine whether or not you would be on terrorist watch lists or the no-fly list. So. Um, I don't know if you can see this graphic very well, but the idea behind it is that a passenger makes a reservation, they pay for the reservation, and then before the passenger ever gets to the airport, a background check is conducted on them and on their method of payment. So if you're not part of the mainstream, maybe if you're flying one way, or if you live uh, really far from the airport, or if you've moved around a lot, then you might be flagged. And when you get to the airport, they use that information to determine whether you should be searched, detained, or allowed to pass through. So whether or not you're on a watch list um, doesn't depend on whether you've tried to bring explosives to an airport. It can depend uh, simply on how often you've moved. Torch has a little description of um, their project, which I thought was interesting. You can see they made initial overtures to airlines to get the data. They were rejected. They were given assurances that they would have the database being used by the CAPS-2 contractors. They did not receive that. Instead, they received the JetBlue database. This was a very limited database because JetBlue only flies to particular locations, and they have um, sort of an unusual segment of the traveling population. They don't have as many business travelers. Torch then purchased uh, the credit database on passenger demographics. Um, they displayed, for example, anomalous demographic information that they had about one passenger. They did not black this information out. 
This poor person, um, actually I suspect it's two people whose records have been, been mixed up, their social security numbers and address histories have been on the internet for something like seven years now. Um, but I thought I'd be nice and black this information out. Stuff like a messed up credit report could potentially get you flagged by their system as anomalous, and uh, these people could have trouble getting through an airport security. Here's an example of one of their passenger stability indicators that they figured out. How long you've lived someplace. If you're really old, like 100 years old, but you've only lived someplace for a year, that might get you flagged for extra screening. Um, or stuff like that. So a little history of the no-fly list. Um, the the no-fly list was created on September 11th. It was actually a no-transport no list that the FBI had. Um, by 2006, there were 44,000 people on the no-fly list, and credit reports were one of the factors that were used in assessing risk. Nowadays, the terrorist watch list has over a million names, and some of the people who have been obviously mistakenly on things like the no-fly list are children, small kids, and Senator Ted Kennedy. Unfortunately, there was a terrorist out there who went by the name Ted Kennedy, so um, Senator Ted Kennedy got flagged and had trouble flying. Part? Yeah. So this month, um, the secure flight system goes into effect on August 15th. If you're flying after August 15th, um, you will be required when you make a reservation to provide not just your name as it is listed on your government-issued ID, not that you're required in the United States to have a government-issued ID, um, but you have to provide your name as it's listed on your government-issued ID, your date of birth, and your gender in order to book travel. That information is shared by the airlines with TSA, and TSA will then use that to determine um, information about how you're treated when you try to board. You can see this is a graphic from TSA. The passenger sends uh, their extra information, including date of birth and gender, to the airlines. The airlines send that to the secure flight system. Secure flight sends boarding pass instructions back, and that impacts how you board. Um, interesting thing to note here, you can see it says passenger information will be sent securely between the airlines and secure flight, and boarding pass instructions will be sent securely back. But when the passenger makes their reservation and sends all that in extra information to the airline, there's no guarantee of any extra security. I think one of the first things we learn as security, geek, as security geeks is that a chain is only as good as its weakest link. TSA has claimed that secure flight um, is exempt from a, num a number of normal requirements. They are exempt from requirements which uh, relate to your ability to request access to your records and correct the records that they have about you. You don't have that right. Um, they're exempt from the requirement to collect only relevant and necessary information so they can collect whatever they want. They're exempt um, from the requirement to maintain all of the records that they use in making a, de a determination about whether you should be searched or detained or allowed to pass through or however they want to treat you. And as a result, it makes it very difficult to audit their systems. And they're exempt, not that we're allowed to audit their systems, they're exempt from the requirement of judicial review. So they've basically thrown checks and balances out the window. And I have to thank the EFF um, for calling this out publicly. They've really done an enormous amount of work to publicize um, these exemptions. Why is all of this happening? Um, why are people being put on no-fly lists? Why are we being monitored? Why is our data being gathered and mined? Uh, one of the words that keeps coming up, um, especially in TSA literature, is terrorism. We're trying to prevent terrorists, we're trying to prevent terrorist attacks. So given the amount of money and time and effort that's being put in all, into all this, you would assume that terrorism is a really big problem. So um, I got some death statistics and terrorism statistics. The year that I could get full statistics for that was the most recent was 2006. You can see that terrorism is the first Actually, uh, heart disease is the first cause, the leading cause of death in the United States. But terrorism is actually uh, malignant neoplasms are the second cause of death in the United States. And um, it looks like influenza and pneumonia are number eight. Suicide is number 11. Essential hypertasm, hypertension and assault, all of these things kill tens and in some cases even hundreds of thousands of United States citizens each year. Um, the number of United States citizens killed worldwide as a result of terrorism in 2006 was 28. So a thousand times more people are killed by suicide than terrorism in the United States. Five times as many people are killed by plane crashes, and almost twice as many people are killed by lightning. 
<laughs> so what could explain the TSA's priorities? It appears that if the TSA uh, spent more time screening for influenza rather than explosives or mining your credit reports, then fewer people would die. Um, just to take a little bit more of a global view on this, I know as a United States citizen, I'm kind of United States-centric, but even globally, uh, the terrorism statistics are surprisingly low. You can see um, that since the 90s, they've hovered around, actually under 5,000 people in the entire world whose deaths, whose deaths can be attributed to terrorism. There was a little bump around September 11th, but other than that, it's been relatively steady. Fly clear. Um, your biometric information, in order to help you move more quickly through the security line at airports, uh, private companies are capitalizing on this. So um, intelligence agencies and places like TSA are able to use terrorism as an excuse to get more information on people. And private companies are benefiting as well. Um, unfortunately, FlyClear, the company behind FlyClear, didn't do so well. They had a system where people's biometric information was collected, and that could be used to facilitate uh, airport security. So you could go faster through airport security. FlyClear um, went out of business, and a lot of people have been wondering what is going to happen to their biometric information information because they don't want it to be shared. One of the questions on FlyClear's FAQ is, will personally identifiable information be sold? They don't answer this question directly. All they say is that the, your biometric information will only be used by another registered traveler program with the TSA. So it implies that the answer is yes, your biometric information is now an asset of a company that has gone out of business and it can be sold to other companies. You don't know their privacy policies, you don't know what this information is used for, and unfortunately you don't have any control, you don't have any way to opt out. Finally, um, the last section we're going to go through is uh, personal tracking devices. Verichip was the FDA's first um, approved implantable identification system. It has a unique 16-digit number. And uh, there's a great blogger. If you look on the presentation, I have a full link to his site. Um, he calls it a, essentially a glorified dog tag. And he was able to sniff the 16-digit code off of his friend's Verichip and then clone it so that he had one just like it. Wolves, when wolves attack herds of animals, they generally start by attacking the very young or the very old, and Verichip seems to have the same strategy. Um, <laughs> under a company called Xmark, they have, uh, they have uh, been marketing the hug system. The hug system is a system where as soon as a baby is born at a hospital, it gets an ankle tag, and, any, and then uh, every 10 seconds, the ankle tag broadcasts an RFID pulse, um, which is picked up by the HALO supervisory system. Moms can also get kisses tags, which can tell if the right infant is with the right mother. Staff also get special staff tags, um, and their marketing, marketing material points out that it's really easy for staff to wander around with babies. They say that um, if a staff picks up a baby, they can walk through a door without having to press any buttons. The door will automatically unlock and let them through. So hopefully staff tags are a little harder to clone than the initial implantable Veritip product. Roam Alert is their system for elderly folks. This is being marketed to nursing homes and places like that for wander prevention. So as your grandma... As your grandma walks around her nursing home, they can track her centrally. Um, they not only track her, as we talked about, tracking people is really just one step away from restricting where they go. So if grandma walks into a particular area, the doors can automatically lock, the elevator can automatically lock, and all of the systems are hidden so she'll never know that they exist. Um, there is an enormous potential for travel, restriction, for travel restrictions and for purchasing restrictions, especially because these systems that we're talking about aren't just used to, um, to track where you go, but when you get on the subway, this is your pass, this is what enables you to get onto the subway. 
If Iran, in another 20 years, let's say, had access to systems like this, to mature technologies, we might never see pictures like this appearing in the newspaper because dissidents might not be allowed out of their house. If they were allowed out of the house, they might not have any access to public transportation. They might find if they try to drive on their highway that their cars are automatically stopped. They might not be allowed to fly. They might be locked out of their offices or locked out of their office buildings, um, which could happen if systems like the Lower Manhattan Security Initiative have their way. Um, they could be blocked from making cell phone calls. Probably more likely their cell phone calls will be monitored. And they could find their bank accounts frozen or their credit cards frozen. So there's enormous potential, not just for tracking people, but for restricting how people can communicate and where we can go. In any free society, um, people should have certain rights. We have to be able to control the systems that are being used to monitor us. Tracking systems should be well understood and transparent. People and our representatives should have control over what personal information is tracked and shared. If that information is uh, shared with third parties or if it's used for secondary purposes, we should know about it. And finally, in a free society, electronic payment and communication systems should be capable of supporting private transactions. So you and I and the millions of other Americans who are not criminals, are not terrorists, have the option of going about our daily business without Big Brother watching us. Um, this is a picture of the United States seal. Here's the front, with ev which everybody recognizes. And I love the all-seeing eye on the back of it. My name is Sherry Davidoff. I am the author of philosecurity.org and the co-author of SANS Network Forensics, which is being launched in September. And um, I think we have some extra time. So if people want to have a discussion, I would love to hear your opinion on these systems um, and how you feel they should be controlled or what, how you feel we should manage them. Thank you very much. Hi, Sherry. Is there no mic? Can you? Can we get the mic on? Hi. Um, that was a great presentation. I'm really more angry than I was when I walked in. <laughs> awesome. So I just wanted to say uh, your terrorism statistics were off by several orders of magnitude. Uh oh. Uh, specifically, you forgot to include the fact that the United States and uh, the United States has killed more than half a million Iraqis. And uh, I think the thing that people need to think about here is that what we're doing is creating a worldwide police state. And in this worldwide, I just went to Shenzhen and I saw these cameras you're talking wow. about. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, IBM did the same thing during the Holocaust, exactly the same thing. And we have to stand up to it. So if anyone in this room works at places where you have information like this, you should send it to WikiLeaks and leak this information. The only way we can fight this is if the people that are actually supporting it and paying for it with their tax dollars stands up and says, fuck this, we're not gonna take it anymore. Yeah. You have to do that. And you should actively compromise the systems like this that are running. Don't disclose vulnerabilities, own them and leak that shit. That's the only way we'll be able to stop it. That's it. Thanks, Jake. Um, along the lines of IBM, there's a great book called IBM and the Holocaust, uh, which talks about IBM's involvement in the Holocaust and points out that every act of extermination was preceded by an act of registration. IBM designed the punch card systems that were used to register at everyone before they decided who to kill. Yes? Awesome presentation. Uh, I have a question. In doing your research, did you come across or collect any uh, information about what I assume is out there, but I, I haven't seen, um, you know, these days all of us use several email accounts so that we can kind of uh, divide and categorize how other organizations interact with us. I'm wondering uh, if presently or in the future uh, we're all going to get into trying to have sort of multiple identities uh, so that we can have a little bit of control over this too. Obviously when it comes to these sort of human systems for tracking, it's much more involved. I'm wondering if you know any more about that. 
Well, I think we touched on that a little bit. If you look, you should look up Thorpe Glenn's presentation. Um, it's available on the web. And it talks about how they can track people, um, even if they're using multiple cell phones, even if they're using multiple email or IM identity, identities. Um, there's just a lot of information that can help them merge different identities together. And I think that's one of the selling points that uh, private companies are using to market to intelligence agencies. One of the things that I saw that I was very interested in is that um, when you're going to third-party companies, you're not just looking at ones that uh, that are getting aggregated information from them alone. We do that at the same time, like if we pay a traffic ticket online, like um, specifically if you do traffic school online. I used to work for one of those companies, and the security is so minimal. Like. I, when I was just poking around, when I first started working for them, when I didn't really have any information, they're like, please check out what we do. I looked, and the first thing I saw was just incredible um, amounts of security vulnerabilities. You find the login, which was not secure at the time. It was after I started working for them. Um, you could get access not just to your information, but to anyone who had ever been using those sites, to people who had been using it. You could just look up by their email or by their name or by their driver's license and get any information possible huh. about their past inquiries. And that's the, that's the thing is that when you're using any sort of database, you should really be careful as to why you're using it. Like a lot of people use those for convenience, but really make sure to look at the companies you're submitting your own information to. That's one thing that we can personally control and people just don't even think about it. They're just like, oh, this is easy. Click, 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 we're done. And nobody takes pause to say, hey, is this information going to be secure? And that company had like the VeriSign and the Cobra logos. I mean, they, they really did that so people felt secure, but it really right. just wasn't. Well, we should definitely catch up afterwards. I'm interested in hearing more about that. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Sergey. Hey. Uh, awesome talk. So uh, supposing that the government uh, actually gets uh, its hands on the healthcare records for whatever reason, say, to make sure that physicians are only prescribing the right kinds of medicines at the right kind of price, uh, do you see any obstacles to a personal health records being used for profiling within the same systems? No, I think that's probably already happening. In the United States, we have things like, uh, I think, the medical information database. They track um, all prescriptions that you fill. And um, now, especially that the FTC has implemented the... Um, Red, the red flag identification rule that requires you to pre present ID whenever you go to a hospital or a doctor's office. Actually, it doesn't require that, but a lot of times that's the way it's being implemented. Um, it's harder and harder for people to get anonymous or pseudonymous medical treatment. So I think that's a really great point, and I think it's something we should be very, very concerned about, medical records being married in with all the inf other information about us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, thank you very much for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, I have a couple uh, just things I'd like to raise. First, um, I'd like to know what your opinion is about, um, for instance, the green, have you heard of the green dot uh, credit cards they have? The I've heard of that. Can you remind me what that is? Well, basically, the way it's supposed to work, I haven't used one myself, but rather than using your own credit card with, you know, uh, attached to your credit line, you essentially buy this card. So it's like a, a check card. You put 500 bucks down on this card, right, right. and then you use it through that. Uh, the idea is so that uh, credit card fraud, anything like that, they get that number. It's uh, you know, it's not linked to your actual credit. Right. Um, I was just wondering if you knew any of the priv uh, privacy issues with that, if it's linked to your name in that way or anything like that. I have heard about that um, when I was trying to research what anonymous credit cards were available. The only one I could find that was truly anonymous were the Visa Vanilla cards. Um, I think I read a website which said uh, that the green dot cards were, you were required to link that to your identification in order to activate them. Okay. Um, don't quote me on that, but I do remember right. reading that. The only card I think that is you can use truly anonymously are the Visa Vanilla cards, but they only go up to $100. Okay, if he's not, okay. There great. are things like one-time credit card numbers also that you can use to help prevent fraud, but again, those are still linked to your identity. Right, okay. And uh, I noticed a lot of your presentation, you mentioned uh, you know, Chicago, New York. Uh, I'm from L.A. Uh, hmm. Do you have any information about you know, the surveillance state in L.A. or anything like that, or do you know any groups that do anything? 
Um, I haven't specifically looked into LA, especially because I'm from the New York, New Jersey area. I do know that many cities in California are using the RedFlex traffic systems, so that's something that you might want to look into specifically. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so that was a great presentation. I work for the ACU of Northern California on very similar topics. Uh, sorry. I work for the ACU of Northern California on a really similar topic. And my question for you and everyone else here is, you know, everyone in this room is a DEF CON attendee and is interested in the topic, and it's a great audience. How do we take this to the broader world? How can we use our technical skills, our knowledge that this is a real important issue, and make the public aware so that we can actually get lawmakers to pay attention, so we can get companies to pay attention, so we can change the system? That's a really good point. Pardon? That's a really good point. How can we make a difference? Um, the EFF, I know, is, uh, has expressed interest in following up on the red flex traffic system stuff. Probably we just need to get more organized. If you're interested in helping out, if you're interested in volunteering on helping push uh, better legislation or better privacy protections, please email me. Um, my email address is on uh, the CDs. I also have business cards, and you can find me on the web. And um, drop me a line. Hopefully we can be in touch. And come find me, too. I want to know. Uh, thank you for an informative and disturbing presentation. Awesome. I have what might be a rhetorical question because I think I know where you stand on this, but given the events of, well, given what we know of the events and the activities of our government for the last decade and really for the last 40 years, how much faith do you have that legislation can actually have an impact on the types of privacy problems that you've described? I think if legislation is enforced, it can have an enormous impact. Um, for example, there's a big difference, uh, and I know this isn't legislated, but the payment card industry program has made a difference in the way companies um, do auditing and in uh, the fact that some companies are required to undergo external audits, whereas um, I think if we legislate systems which require that people publicize, which provide proper incentives for companies to secure their systems, then it is possible for us to make a difference. If we simply make legislation that says this is illegal, then um, it's probably not going to do a whole lot. As a forensic analyst, as someone who's worked on a lot of um, incident response cases, I can see that a very small percentage of actual data breaches are even detected because companies don't have, don't have incentives to detect them, and those that are detected are not reported because companies will weigh um, the potential fines versus the more likely reputational damage that would happen if they were disclosed and they say well it's worth it for us to risk fines if we're caught so you're right um, legislation can sometimes legislation can make no difference at all but if it's enforced if people are really pushing on it if it makes it so that systems are more visible that we if we have a right to transparency and to find out what happens with our information then it can make a difference so it gets back to the previous questioner's point about how we carry this yep. message out. Yes. All right, thank you. Thank you. I apologize if you've already answered this question, but is your entire presentation on the disk? Um, th my presentation is not available on the DEF CON disk, but it is available. The entire presentation is available on the disk that uh, we passed out by the water coolers, and it will be available on the web um, on DEF CON after this presentation and probably on my website as well. If you need a copy of it and you don't find out, um, if you don't find it on those sites, then just drop me an email. Thank you. A week later, it'll be on the DEF CON site. Hi. Yep. Hi. Uh, just want to share my experiences with uh, anonymous credit cards. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had the best experience with U.S. Bank. Mm. If you walk into a U.S. Bank and ask for an, an, um, a one-time use credit card, they will sell you one without verification of identification for up to $1,000. The fee for this is $3.95, and I'll just give them a fake name. They do ask for a name, but they don't make you verify it. My experience with Riviera was um, I use this card number, um, and then when they on the card, the name is U.S. Bank. When they asked me for a name, I just made up one, and it ran it, and it ran through just fine. So apparently they do not verify the name with the card as long as you have the security code on the back of the card. So it's, U.S. banks always worked really well for me, but you do have to pay that $4 fee to use it every time. That's really interesting. Did they require you to show identification at the hotel? No. Huh. Um, if you could drop me a line after this, I yeah. would love to get some more information. Okay, Thank you. Sure. The question is, where did the thousand bucks come from that he put on the card? Yeah, I, cash. Um, if you give them cash, they'll take it for up to a thousand dollars for the card, and it's uh, it was a thousand dollars and a thousand and three dollars and ninety-five cents because of the surcharge. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. 
I just wanted to make a comment on what's going on in the state of Florida regarding traffic cameras. Um, basically, this, uh, it's, it's illegal for the state of Florida to issue uh, uh, citations um, that are violations of Florida statutes uh, on evidence based from traffic cameras. So what a lot of cities are doing is they're using, they're using the traffic cameras to enforce uh, county uh, city ordinances and local ordinances in order to bypass the state level. And there's legislation in the state of Florida right now to legalize uh, the use of cameras to issue uh, Florida site, uh, state statute violations. And essentially the legislation is coded to allow computers uh, the the discretion of whether or not a law was broken, and once if that passes in Florida, which it probably wow. will, that's going to open a whole other can of, can of worms. Uh, Anybody who lives in Florida, talk to this guy. <laughs> uh, great presentation. In this day of outsourcing and offshoring, will you be having a uh, a study on how much of our private information resides outside the United States? You mean physically resides outside the United States? Yes, anything, anything above where a lot of the laws that we have here may not apply to foreign countries right. or governments. That's a great question, and I don't know the answer to that, but I would be very curious to know. Um, my guess is that a lot of our information resides outside the United States. In Germany, they had a case where they found out that their health information was in India. Very interesting. And available for sale. And available for sale. <laughs> I have plenty of, I'll have business cards up here. Thank you all for coming.